In the midst of the congregation, we will praise you, rejoice in the Lord. O oh, you righteous, and give thanks to God's holy name. As we listen to the prelude, may we all center our thoughts and our hearts on the Lord. Good morning. Welcome to Ann Street United Methodist Church. And if you are visiting with us today, we're glad that you're here. And please fill out the pad at the end of the pew and pass it down. We have, our Lord is active in the life and the ministry of our church. And we have many of opportunities to minister, for ministry and service. And so Feel free to take the bulletin home and so that you'll know what is going on here in the life of our church. We are, uh, uh, okay, August 19th, which is next Sunday, we'll be showing the movie, I Can Almost Imagine, in the Fellowship Hall at 2 o'clock. And so come and watch this wonderful movie that I've heard so much about. Next Sunday morning, during the Sunday school hour in the fellowship hall, will be an annual conference report from the pastor and Rachel Dawson. Are there any other announcements today? With that being the case, let us all stand for our call to worship. We cry out to you, O Lord. Hear our voices and heed our prayers. We wait for the fulfillment of your promises, O God. Renew our hope and restore our joy. 
We gather to receive your strength, O Christ. Feed us with the breath of eternal life. Come, let us worship. And now at this time, extend the love of Christ to someone near you.
Good morning. We'll start off our hymn sing with number 530, Are Ye Able? Follow that with 402, Lord, I want to be a Christian. And a uh, choice from the congregation. Seven oh seven, did I hear? Seven oh seven. And if the children would come down for the uh, children's sermon, please. <coughs> Good morning. How you guys doing this morning? What, what do you know? What is this? this? Mm. Basket. Basket. I want to tell you a story about Moses. When he was born, some of the Pharaoh's men wanted to destroy him. And Moses' mother puts him in a basket like this, almost, and hid, hides him in the water among the marsh. And then the Bible tells us that one day, the Pharaoh's daughter was out there taking a bath. And she looks up. She happens to hear the baby crying. And she has her, one of her girls go and get the basket. And guess what's in the basket? Baby. And so the Bible tells us. And so she hears the baby and she rescued the baby from the basket. And so... Today, and so we see in the story that the Pharaoh's daughter was kind to this little baby and raised him. And so.
Today, our pastor is going to talk to us a little bit about kindness and being tender-hearted towards others. And, and, but find someone this week that you can be kind to. It could be your mother, your father, your teacher, or your friend. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we have opportunities every week to show kindness and love and compassion to those we come in contact with. And so may we be, have our eyes open this week for opportunities to be loving. For we pray in your, Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. <coughs> Today the scripture reading is from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 25 through 5-2. So then, putting away falsehood, let us, all, let us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing rather than let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out your mouths, but what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God for which you, you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness, wrath, anger, and wrangling, slander, to, and slander, together with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of God for us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you this morning as well. And hear now a word from John 6, 35 and also 41 through 51. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me will never drive away. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread of, that came down from heaven. And they were saying, Is not this Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written by the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Again, this is the word of God for the thankful people of God. Thanks be to God. One of our favorite parts of a worship service, at least most of you feel like it's favorite part. Sometimes introverts have a hard time with it, and I understand that. But one of our most, oftentimes people's most favorite part of a worship service is 
getting to greet their neighbors and uh, fellowshipping uh, at a time in the service that's appointed and um, being able to welcome others around you and, and most of all to offer peace. Uh, to, to say good morning, perhaps, but to extend God's peace, something special, a little bit peculiar, something you don't always end up saying to everybody that you pass on the street. Peace. You extend a hand or a hug. I fondly remember the greetings uh, of many of our sisters and brothers here that aren't with us. I remember, forgive me, uh, very fun. I remember Howard uh, uh, pushing a mint into my hand every time <laughs> I greet him. <laughs> so sweet. It was so sweet. I remember Carol uh, Dixon uh, brightly smiling and greeting everybody. She usually sat back over here. So many, so many. We could go on. Uh, but these are the moments that we remember and treasure and we think about them as the week goes by. And we see someone at church and say, I hope I get to say hi to them. But I think we mean, I hope I get to bring peace to them. Because it's more than just a good morning. It's a worshipful act. What you're doing is not just about you and that person. You are signifying a peace that God intends for all of creation. When you offer peace to someone else and exchange that with the other person, it's you two and God. It's a sign of unity, a sign of togetherness before God. And that's a worshipful act to show God we're together, we're one. There are a lot of things you do in worship as a sign of unity. Uh, I made a short list. I wonder if you're thinking of any. What are some of the things we do in worship? that are signs of unity. Why don't you answer? If you have an idea, just tell me what you think. It's a little game. Sing. Singing together with one voice. Exactly. Similar to that, you also show unity when you pray aloud with one voice, don't you? For example, the Lord's Prayer, oftentimes. What else? At 11, they confess their faith together with one voice, right? And you do that once in a while, too. Uh, bringing offerings before God, lifting them up before the cross, saying it's the collective gift of the people to the work of God. But you engage in perhaps the most significant act of togetherness and unity uh, when you come around the Lord's table, as we did last week, as we do you share bread and cup. And right before I pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured on the gifts of bread and wine, do you know what I pray for right before that too? I pray that the Spirit will be poured out on us. And you have to listen carefully, especially if you're used to hearing it over and over and over again. You have to listen carefully. The prayer is that the Spirit be poured out on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. You know, my, my heart beats a little harder in those moments because I know that I'm praying that we will be one, that God's Spirit will be upon us. And at the end of the prayer, when I say, by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, okay, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, In that moment, we're praying for our local church here, for our worldwide church, across all different traditions and types. In that moment, the Spirit leads us to do a sort of gut check, a reality check. Has God bound us together with one another? Here and there and everywhere in the past, in the present, and in the future. Because things that are out there, they strain at our unity, and we know that. It might be some things like hymn preferences or worship styles. Those things strain at unity sometimes, and that's understandable. Might be other things, might be core values that people feel, and they say, well, you know, this is most important to me, and 
and it's, I don't, why, shouldn't it, why isn't it more important to you and, and this kind of thing? All the divisions between Christians are enough to make people outside this, this gathering suspect of Christians. People who don't go to church and don't know the, the love of the Savior, they're suspect of the unity of Christians. And they say, well, why, do they, why should I go be part of that when they just fight among themselves all the time? There's a, an episode of the, of, and I hate, I, I, I'm careful to say it, one time, that about 15 years ago, I shared this little anecdote, this little story, and all I heard afterwards was, the preacher watches The Simpsons. Yeah, okay. I'm going to put it out there. I've seen a few episodes of The Simpsons. <laughs> Big deal. Okay. There's one, and you can write your letters to it and all that, whatever. The, Homer, because it, it's a good illustration. Homer's in church. And he's hugging his neighbors, his friends, and his folks. And he goes to church. The family goes to church. They're having a great time hugging, loving. Him. Well, it, he's full of love, and he's having a great experience. And church is over. They go out to the parking lot. Well, sweet old little miss, little miss old lady, she accidentally can't see. She, can't, she pulls out in the parking lot, and Homer has to slam on the brakes to avoid hitting her in the parking lot. And sure enough, Homer, the very one that gave that woman a hug, gave her a new gesture in the parking lot that he shouldn't have. It just shows our, uh, our, our quick tendencies to forget this, that we're together in unity and go back to the way things usually are. But none of the problems that plague the church today would surprise the writer of Ephesians, the one we traditionally think of as Paul. In, in, in Ephesians, talk about a church with problems. You name it. Ephesus had it. I mean, did you catch the things that he said they were doing? He said, stop these things. Now, <laughs> think about it. Lying. Okay. Ooh. Anger that festers in the heart. Stealing. Wait a minute. Folks, they were stealing from one another in church. Wrath, bitterness, wrangling, evil talk, slander, all of these, he says, grieve the Holy Spirit. What a picture. Woo. I don't think I'd go to that church myself if I saw the people doing that. You know? Paul says they need to cast off their old ways and take on these new ways. And he gets real specific. And he says, verse by verse, he just says, they have to speak truth to one another. Put away falsehood. Let all speak truth to their neighbors, for we are members of one another. And that's a, that's a good point for us. And I don't know a lot of lying that goes on in the body of Christ, but I, I think, though, um, in, in many ways it's uh, important to have those covenants and bonds and love that you can tell one another truth in love and and speak um, with kindness, and, and so the other person can hear it. Uh, then the next verse, he said, don't let the, their anger get the better of them. Don't let the sun go down on their anger. And well, that's a whole sermon in itself, isn't it? Uh, but, but that's another example of the, of the peace and the love with which they're to treat each other. And certainly those who are stealing need to stop, not just because it's wrong, but interesting, Paul says it's because they're robbing the other people of sharing what God has given uh, them through their offerings. And then he said, they need to speak words that build up. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up. Again, a whole sermon there. But for now, to hold that together with the others and say, this is a love with which they're to love one another. So now, if you'll do me a favor and just now reconsider and think about this passing of the peace work that we do when we're a worshipful people, see it in a radical light that God is showing us through Christ. Now it's not just a greeting, although the greeting is a wonderful part of it, and good morning to everybody, but it's more than that. It's a term of endearment. It's a sign of the unity and the love with which we hold one another. When you say peace, when you say good morning or God be with you, God's peace, whatever those may look like for you. 
whether you're old friends or a husband and wife or a frustrated parent that the son and daughter fought them all the way to church that morning, but then you come together and in that moment you say, peace be with you and to your own child. Passing of the peace can be a springboard for two pewmates who don't know one another. The person down the way or the person behind you or in front of you that you don't know. And through offering peace, you then have a beginning with which to create relationship. Today, I, I wonder if you'll take Paul's advice in Ephesians and practice peacemaking in other aspects of your life too. I'm going to try to. Maybe you'll join me this week in that. To greet our neighbors and greet our co-workers and our schoolmates and, and our friends and people we don't know with the kind of peace. Peace. Will you make room for people in the peace of Christ? As an example, I want to tell you about uh, the, some seasons coming up here in our church. Uh, some very special, beautiful opportunities we're going to have to, to be church and be the peace of Christ with one another. The first uh, comes in August. Uh, it started in August, and all through August we are setting aside time of prayer and reflection uh, to pray for our church locally, globally, uh, and to listen to God uh, as Methodists face some difficult decisions next year. In the month of September, in September, we'll be practicing and participating in, a, in an evangelism program called Back to Church Sunday. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a good way. It ties in with back to school. It's back to church. And it's a really great reminder for folks because, you know, they get out of the habit. And uh, maybe some people miss it for, miss church for a while. Other people miss it for, for years. And uh, it's a good reminder. We'll have some opportunities to do that. We'll give you some uh, cards that you can give to friends to uh, invite them and, uh, and many ways like that. In October, we'll then uh, have a sermon series and a church-wide emphasis for about five weeks on the parts of our discipleship vows. Uh, this carries over in a beautiful way from what we did uh, with the vision and uh, thinking about our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Five Sundays, each one. Uh, a time to focus on each of those prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And you'll be, I know, looking for our stewardship program as you do in the fall. We're going to merge that into the gifts part of the five Sunday emphasis on overall discipleship. So we'll see our stewardship as one of the five parts of our discipleship and, and, and prepare for God's work with, uh, among us in the same way. Uh, and then after that, but before Advent starts... We'll have a few weeks to take the first of our goals and objectives from our vision. Uh, the one about identifying our spiritual gifts. Identifying our spiritual gifts. And we're going to have a few weeks where our own Lindsay Allen, Lindsay's back there, she's excited. She's got some helpers that are going to help her. And she's taken a, a resource uh, that she's working with us to prepare and put on some programs for us on spiritual gifts help us identify and take a spiritual gifts inventory, um, each one, and then uh, be able to uh, learn more about God in us. So I'm very excited about those. It's a very special fall season we have, and uh, a way of deepening our relationship with God and with one another. <clears throat> but I'll close out today, though, uh, with an example, an image, employed by St. John Chrysostom, the fourth century... In the 300s, not long after Jesus' life, when he once preached on this text, he talked about something that, I don't know if any of you have them, but he talked about bees and beekeeping. I don't know if we have any beekeepers, but do we have, do we? I won't ask you questions, but just nod. If you, you don't have to say anything. Do we have any beekeepers? Eh, not right now. He talked about beekeepers in his time hundreds and hundreds of years ago. He said that they would take a clean vessel like a pot or a wicker basket. And when they wanted to keep their bees in harmony, in peace with one another and with the beekeeper, they would sprinkle it with scented perfumes and ointments 
and sweet odors. And when they did this, the bees would settle down in the vessel. And they'd work together, and they'd get along. They wouldn't go out stinging everybody. <laughs> and he said this. He said, our soul is a sort of vessel or basket capable of receiving the swarms of spiritual gifts. But if there shall be within it gall and bitterness and wrath, the swarms will fly away. Hence this blessed and wise beekeeper well and thoroughly cleans our vessels. You see the metaphor there, don't you? Withholding neither knife nor instrument of iron. He's going to get in there really hard and, and scrub away at us. And invites us to this spiritual swarm. And as he gathers it, he cleanses us with prayers and labors and all the rest. Not a bad image to carry with us this week, is it? May it be so for you and for me. That the talk that comes from our mouths would be only that which is useful for building up. That we not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Be kind to one another, he says, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you. And we pray that God's Spirit will make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. In response, 558. We are the church.
As the good song says, we are praying, aren't we, together? I hope you'll be in prayer. Uh, this week we are thinking of Elizabeth Vick and encouraging her with our prayers and support, Elizabeth Vick, and uh, also Bobby Baker, uh, Darla Vick's father, uh, who's fallen ill, so uh, prayer for Bobby Baker, Darla Vick's father. And prayers uh, from uh, Herbert Thomas, we thank you for lifting up prayers for uh, the family of William F. Meredy, uh, the, known um, to many in the area as uh, the attorney of our, of our late uh, Michael Smith, uh, and uh, that he has passed, as we understand today, at this recently here. Uh, also, a prayer for Tom and Sharon Pierce. Tom and Sharon Pierce. Uh, Kristen, uh, thank you for inviting us to pray for Mrs. Gordon uh, upon her breast cancer diagnosis and uh, Aunt Nancy Whipple um, and dealing with an infection. We sure will. Uh, Barbara uh, Hoey, uh, a prayer for Betty Krieger. Uh, yes, we're praying for Betty Krieger these days. For Eileen Gavin and for traveling mercies for your sister Ann Russell. We sure will. Uh, Chuck and Claudia, thank you. Uh, Lewis, thank you for uh, lifting up a prayer for the Alvin West Jr. family. Alvin West Jr. family. And uh, today I see um, our uh, dear family, too, of, of Maxine McDonald, and we continue to pray for uh, prayers and sympathies and love for the family of Maxine with us today, too. These and many others, I'm sure, uh, fill your hearts. Uh, I also invite us to pray for peace in Charlottesville this weekend, too, um, and uh, that we would all just uh, go to God together in this time. Let's go to God together. <coughs> Wonderful Lord, you are the one who says to us, peace be with you. You say, my peace I give with you. Through Christ, you say that you do not give as the world gives, and that we should no longer let our hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. God, make us vessels of your peace, your kindness, your love. Let no unhelpful or any hurtful word come out of our mouths, but only that which is useful for building up. We thank you for orienting us to your ways, your ethic, your uh, Holy Spirit this, this week that we might be reminded of these truths contained in our scriptures. And that as we go forward, we may be faithful people who, who are vessels of peace wherever we go. When we encounter conflict or hurt or oppression, that we might resist them in whatever forms they present themselves. <laughs> that we might create community as we seek to do so faithfully through our ministries in our beautiful Beaufort area. And may your Holy Spirit be upon us all as children of God sent out today with a word of love from your Holy Spirit and sent out to emulate the life of the one who taught us what you love and what peace truly is, the Prince of Peace, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now at this time, will the ushers please come to the front and the alkalite for the giving of our gifts, tithes, and our offerings.
Gracious Father, we praise you for all the many ways that you have showed your kindness to us, for all the times that we have failed and forgiven us. Get, we give this gift as an outward expression of our great love that we have for you and our way of thanking you for your grace. Use it and spread the gospel to all the world. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is 557. Today, uh, I'm going to station myself by that uh, door uh, going toward the hall. And I hope that, uh, especially if you have not become a member of our church, uh, uh, I would love to uh, have a conversation with you. I can direct you toward a room there. We can talk uh, after I greet the others. Uh, so uh, come find us. We'd be honored, uh, and we'd love to have that discussion with you if you've been thinking about joining. Um, we go now from this place with the peace of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who ultimately gives us the peace that passes all understanding. Amen. Amen.